everyone, it's Michaela. Welcome back to my channel. So today is a very long awaited video. I've been wanting to film this video for so, so long. And it is my honest thoughts on the documentary Blackfish. If you guys want to watch this film for free, I believe it is on YouTube. I will go ahead and link it down below. The description box is going to be full of resources this video. So if you are going to look at the description box for any of my videos, please have it be this one. There's going to be a lot of information and resources down there. But if you're interested in watching this film, if you don't have Netflix or anything, it will be linked down below and you can watch it for free on YouTube. I have a very detailed history with SeaWorld, so this is going to be a very long video. So sit back, grab a drink, grab a snack, and let's dive in. My history with SeaWorld started in 2002. I really wish I was home so I could put these pictures in but there's pictures of me sitting on little whale statues and I had some pictures of the killer whales at that point in time. And I started going when I was two years old, like I said, in 2002. And after that, my family really went pretty much once a year up until 2010, I believe. And I remember so vividly, it was summer of 2010. So it was after waterworks were banned, trainers were no longer allowed in the water with the whales. But I remember sitting there vividly in Shamu Stadium in San Diego. I can tell you exactly where we were sitting. But I just remember watching that show and I was mesmerized. I always loved SeaWorld, but that point in time, I was like, I love killer whales. And that really, really opened my heart to killer whales. And that trip right there was what started this personality trait of mine that I call liking killer whales. <laughs> I don't have any memories of going to SeaWorld from 2010 to 2012, but in 2012, when I was 12 years old, I found an Instagram account that posted SeaWorld pictures and pictures of the killer whales from SeaWorld. And 12 year old me was like, oh my gosh, I love that. I'm gonna do that too. So I started my own account. I don't even remember the username. I wish that I could go back and look at that account but it is now my wildlife photography account and everything was deleted and wiped from there. In 2012, I fell in love. No, not even fell in love. I was infatuated with SeaWorld. And let's see, in 2012, I was in seventh grade and I told my mom, I was like, I wanna go to SeaWorld camp. Like I wanna do everything at SeaWorld. And I'm pretty sure my mom thought what the hell is wrong with my child why is she so suddenly obsessed with sea world so i'm so sorry i put you through that mom i really am so i was never able to go to sea world camp just because i went to go visit my father over the summer at that point in time and it just never lined up with our family vacations and just i never got to go so i remember my mom told me if i got an a in my seventh grade math class in the last quarter of the school year that she would pay for me to do the Beluga Interaction Program. And you bet your sweet pippy, Michaela did everything humanly possible to get an A in math, and I did. That was the first and the last time I'll ever get an A in math, but I did it. So that summer, me and my mom went down to SeaWorld and I did the Beluga Whale Interaction Program. Just look, look at mini Michaela. This is adorable. For that trip, my mom and I bought the like pay for a day, you can come all year. I think it was called like a fun card or something. And we would go probably once every month or once every other month. Up until I was 16, that was my life. SeaWorld everything. I had my photography in my room, in the front of my binders. Like everyone knew me as the girl that was obsessed with SeaWorld. That's probably why I didn't have a lot of friends. When I turned 16, I started dating, I started playing sports, I started actually going out with my friends on the weekends, and SeaWorld kind of didn't have a part in my life anymore, it didn't really fit in that point in time in my life. And it wasn't until senior year, I think, yeah, it was spring break of 2018, and I was dating my boyfriend Casey, you guys have seen him on my channel many, many times, and I found my old SeaWorld account, and I logged into it, and I was like, I miss this, like I genuinely miss this feeling of being so happy. And so I told him about my my past and I did not, I remember I did not want to tell him because I was like, he's gonna think I'm weird and he's gonna break up with me and then I'm gonna be alone. 
but I told him and he was like, whoa, that's actually really cool that you're so into this. Like, let's get SeaWorld passes and we can go all the time. And if I didn't love him before that, I sure as hell loved him after. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. So we got our passes and we did the Dine with Shamus. We did so many interactions. And actually for our first year anniversary, like our one year anniversary, he treated me to the Beluga encounter, not the one you get in the water with, but the one where you like are on the side of the pool. And he told me he really liked it. I'm not sure if he actually liked it or if he was just saying that because the girl he loved also loved SeaWorld. But babe, if you're watching this, thank you for putting up with me in that point in my life. <laughs> so that was November of 2018. In December of 2018, I figured out that SeaWorld San Antonio had a career camp for college students since I graduated from high school in 2018. And I saved up all of my money and I signed up for it and I booked it for July of 2019. In between that point in time, I was still going to SeaWorld, doing my thing, loving life. I did a couple Killer Whale Up Close tours, which was really cool at the point in time. Camp came and I actually met one of my best friends through camp and I will forever be grateful that I went to SeaWorld camp and met her there. Maybe I'll film a video with her because I see her this summer in a couple weeks. So maybe we'll do a video about how we met because it's actually like really funny. When I was at SeaWorld camp, I went back and forth. I remember like watching the trainers um, like interact with the animals and feed the animals and take care of them. And I went back and forth. I was like, is this really what I want to do? And I wasn't sure. And I just started questioning SeaWorld at that point because I questioned them in the past, like when Blackfish came out, I watched Blackfish, and at first I was like, absolutely not, SeaWorld does nothing wrong. But throughout the years, especially when I took a pause from the SeaWorld community, I was like, no, nah, I don't really like SeaWorld anymore, like, and I don't really support them. And then I came back and I started supporting them again. But once I went to camp and I really got like an insight about what SeaWorld does and what SeaWorld actually looks like from behind the scenes, I didn't really want to support them anymore. That's not saying like they abuse their animals behind the scenes or anything. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying like when I finally saw behind the scenes, I just chose not really to support them anymore. But I was back and forth pretty much all throughout SeaWorld camp. But after I left SeaWorld camp, I literally, I got back from SeaWorld camp. And then the day after that, I went to SeaWorld. I obviously still chose to support them. And it wasn't until January 2020, me and a friend took a girl's trip to Orlando and we did the whole Disney World thing. We did Discovery Cove and we also did SeaWorld Orlando. And I hate myself for deleting those pictures because it, it was a happy time in my life. Like I loved being there and I loved meeting the Orlando pod and I will forever beat myself up for deleting those pictures. I was sitting in the Orlando Killer Whale Stadium and I thought to myself, I will never come back here. I do not support this anymore. And I just don't want to do it. And at that point, I started going whale watching and I started seeing dolphins and whales in the wild. And when I physically was sitting at SeaWorld and mentally thought about what I saw whale watching and what I'm seeing now, that is when I made the decision to never support SeaWorld again and to never return. March of 2020, I did get hired on a whale watching boat and I still work there when I go home for spring break and I will continue to work there in summer break in a couple weeks when I go back home. But that's just kind of my history with SeaWorld. I, I will never regret supporting SeaWorld because it genuinely made me who I am today. Now that you guys have a little bit of my history about SeaWorld, I wanna talk about what happened when I initially saw the film in 2013. When the film came out, I was pretty scared to watch it because I was scared to have my eyes opened to the point where I would not support SeaWorld anymore. So me and my mom watched it, and after my mom watched it, she was like, absolutely not, I do not support SeaWorld anymore. I don't wanna go. I would be lying if I said that Blackfish did not make me question my support for SeaWorld in 2013. But obviously I overcame it. Obviously it didn't affect me that much because I still continued to support them. But even when I first saw it, it started making the wheels turn a little bit. Of course I ignored it though. So the first thing, by the way, I have a really long list on my phone of notes that I took from the film. But the first thing I have on this list is Blackfish likes to misuse footage to their advantage. 
So one example was Samantha Berg was saying, oh yeah, I wrote a killer whale. This is my first time doing waterworks. The video overlaying her saying that is Holly who worked at SeaWorld Orlando and that is from Believe Behind the Scenes on YouTube. I really have to wonder if they had to get SeaWorld's permission to use their footage or not. If anyone knows that, please let me know. I'm not too familiar in the video copyright whole thing, but I also thought if they got a bunch of people's permission to use the footage that is in this film. But Blackfish, like I said, likes to misuse it to their advantage. It's been a couple times where they were talking about the separation of calves and they were saying Taki Takina, oh my gosh, Katina, like when they were saying Katina was crying and screaming because Kalina was being moved to another park. The footage that they were showing there of, I can't like describe it, it was in the underwater viewing and the whale has her mouth wide open and she's like thrashing it back and forth. Um, that's not even Katina. Um, that is an interaction in the underwater viewing, I believe, either in Orlando or San Diego. Pretty sure it's San Diego. That's a lot of people's problem with this film, is it likes to misuse footage. Another thing that seems to come up a lot is within the first minute of the film, they are showing the 911 call between SeaWorld and obviously 911 when Don Brancho was being attacked. And they're like, they swallowed the arm, Tilikum has her arm blah, 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 a whale ate one of the trainers, which that is, you know, I don't wanna say like that's wrong because I ho I will never know how the person making that 911 phone call felt, but I wanna say it's probably just panic. They panicked and said, oh my God, they swallowed the arm, Tilikum ate her, but I definitely don't think it should have been used in that part of the movie because within the first 30 seconds, they're making you seem like, oh my God, this whale ate the trainer. Like, oh my God, that's awful. When what happened, it was awful, but she was not eaten and neither was her arm. So I guess that's another misusage of audio or footage. That being said, another thing I didn't like with the film is when the investigator and Thomas Tobin, the I think he's the SeaWorld paramedic, when they were talking, Thomas Tobin did not do a good job of explaining what happened to Don whatsoever. The investigative and the autopsy report for Don Brancho and her case are all public record. That is another thing that will be linked in the description box. I will say it's very graphic. The autopsy and the investigative report are very, very sad to read. However, if you want to do more research, that's just what comes with doing more research into this film but it will be linked down below. Read at your own discretion. I read it and it just, it'll be in the description box if you wish to read into it. I don't know why they kept saying he swallowed her arm because if you read the autopsy report, it's very evident that he did not. And I don't even know why they included that in the film because I don't even know because it's a bold faced lie. That's one of the bold faced lies that is in this film but I just don't understand why they were like, this isn't true, let's put it in our documentary. I... One thing I did like in this film is that they mentioned the Pen Cove captures that happened on August 8th in 1970. I know they didn't include it to educate you on these captures. I know they put it in there to fit their agenda and to make people think, oh my gosh, these whales were captured. How sad, which it is sad, but I know they didn't put it in there to educate people. They put it in there to make people feel sorry for the whales and to hate SeaWorld. But I do like that they put it in there because it's something that not a lot of people know happened. And when I've talked to people about it, they're like, oh, that's from like, the 1920s, right? And I'm like, no, that was literally like 50 years ago in the 70s and there's videos of it. And I actually do like that they provided videos for it because it shows people that this didn't happen a long time ago. Like I said, I like that they mentioned the Pen Cove captures. However, it didn't have anything to do with Tilikum and the movie is very based around Tilikum and his life, but they did show Icelandic captures when SeaWorld got kicked out of Washington and they moved to Iceland. I just wish they would have 
talked about the pen cove captures a little more because that plays a big part in why the southern residents are endangered because so many of their pod members were ripped from them to put in captivity or died because of them trying to capture whales but it just seems like they put it in there and they're like here's the very base info for this topic you do with it what you will which the public doesn't tend to do correctly they tend to just see that and then they're like oh i'm an expert on it so the first big topic that they covered was kelty burns death and how tilikum was involved in that and on february 20th i forget the year what year was it 1990 i think i suck at dates if I say any dates, please disregard them, except the Pen Cove captures. I have that one memorized. He was at Sealand of the Pacific in British Columbia, Canada. At that time, Sealand of the Pacific housed three orcas, and they were Tilikum, Nootka, and Haida. The movie explains that Tilikum did not get along with Nootka or Haida, and Nootka and Haida would be paired up with Tilikum to train him, and if Tilikum didn't do something right, they would all get punished. So therefore, they didn't really get along with him, which is understandable because you're taking three orcas from different populations and you're putting them together. In the documentary, the witnesses, I don't remember their names, but they were like, oh, it's the one with the flopped over fin. He was the one that grabbed Kelty. Well, if you look at a picture of all three of these whales, they all three have some form of bent over fin. So it's very hard to pinpoint exactly which whale attacked Kelty. It was confirmed that they were all three involved, but it's very hard to pinpoint which one was the one who kept dragging her down and the one who eventually killed her. That part within itself has a lot of inaccurate information. That incident, Sealand of the Pacific did end up closing as stated in the film, and then SeaWorld bought Tilikum and he was moved to SeaWorld Orlando. There was a part in the film, I don't exactly remember which part, but they were like, we didn't know that Tilikum was aggressive and we didn't know that he had aggressive tendencies and something else along those lines. If you guys didn't know, every SeaWorld killer whale has a profile or a file about them. And it clearly states in Tilikum's profile, they showed it in the movie, that he lunges at trainers and all the things that aggravate him, which is also public record. So if you guys want to go ahead and check that out, it'll be linked in the description box as well. Like I said, there will be lots of information down there this video. The film also likes to claim that an orca has not done any harm to any human out in the wild, where that's half true. So in Ketchikan, there was a boy swimming in 1999. He was swimming off the coast of a beach with his friends. And my roommate actually told me this story because her brother's friend of a friend or like something like that, this happened to his brother. So they were swimming off of a beach and the orca ended up bumping him. I'm sure it was out of curiosity because killer whales are not man-eating machines like people like to think they are. And I think the kid had like bruises or like a broken rib or something like that. So technically an orca has done harm to a human out in the wild but I don't believe it's in the same context as they do at SeaWorld. Oh, and going back to Tilikum's profile, I read through it and it said there was an incident in 1999 involving a guest with Tilikum. And I, I couldn't find literally anything about this, but it's in his profile, so it happened, but I could not find anything about this incident. And I'm kind of surprised that Blackfish didn't like jump on this because they could have been like, he's a being aggressive towards guests, but I could not find anything. I don't know anything about that. So if you guys have any information, can you point me in that direction? Because I'm actually really curious about that incident that happened with the guests in 1999. I don't even know, like there's nothing on the internet about it. So the next thing I wanna talk about is I actually really liked the part where John Hargrove was explaining that they're not our whales, we don't own them, even though we're the ones feeding them and taking care of them, we have no say in really what happens to them. 
And I think that paints a good picture saying that the trainers do care about these animals because they do. They in fact care about these animals and they don't want them to see them hurt. I've seen a lot of people who have watched Blackfish and they tell me I hate SeaWorld trainers, they're horrible people because they support this and blah 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 blah. But it's not the trainer's fault that these whales get moved around and all these things happen to these whales. It's SeaWorld as a corporation and as a company. And like I said, I'm really happy John Hargrove brought up that point because I've seen so many SeaWorld trainers get so much hate on their Instagrams and just from people on Facebook and people on Twitter talking horribly about them. And then I know John Hargrove does have ill feelings towards SeaWorld, but I really liked how he painted the trainers in a good light because it's not their fault. Nothing that's happening to these orcas is the trainer's fault. The trainers genuinely just love them and care about them. Another thing that I liked that was said was, I forgot who said it, but someone said, um, these orcas aren't families, they're not pods. They are literally orcas from different areas of the world put together in an artificial pod. I really, really liked this because even the Southern Resident Pods, JK and L Pod, they speak the same quote unquote language, but it goes back to what I was saying earlier. They all have a different dialect. Like people in Mexico and Spain all speak Spanish, but if they come together, they're gonna have a little bit of a disconnect because Mexico Spanish is way different than Spanish that is in Spain. And it's even with English. My California speaking English my English speaking in California probably will not match with English speaking in Florida or the South or Chicago or the Midwest or even up here in Alaska. Things are different and the dialect is a little different. So when you put orcas that have different backgrounds with each other and were caught in the Pacific Northwest and then one in Iceland and you put them together, it doesn't mix well, so that's one thing that I think the film has accurately described. Another small thing I wanted to point out was Jeff Ventry was talking about the incident with Candu and Corky. And I don't know if they left this out on purpose or they just simply left it out because they didn't think it was important or they forgot about it, but they stated that Candu rammed Corky. That's what caused her to burst an artery and hemorrhage and bleed out to death. Like I said, I don't know why they didn't include this, but Corky actually moved. So Candu actually rammed the tank wall and burst her blood vessel and then hemorrhaged and bled out to death. So Corky was there. It was directed to hit Corky, but Corky moved and Candu ran into the wall. And the footage of that broke my heart. I've seen it before, but it... It just broke my heart knowing that Kandu just bled out to death and she could not do anything is so incredibly sad and I don't recommend anyone watching that video. If you have a heart for animals, please do not watch that video. It is awful. Another thing I want to touch on is when they're talking about killer whale accidents or instances or incidents that have happened in the parks. All of that is public record. If you guys want to do more research on that, I'll have the records linked down below but it's a lot. I think it's over like 160 accidents or incidents, which that's a lot. And it dates back to like the 60s or something like that. I think it's like 1969 or something like that. Again, don't quote me on dates unless it's the Pen Cove capture date. I just wanted to add that in because a lot of people I've talked to seem interested in expanding their knowledge on that. And that's a great way to do that. Now, all of my notes kind of went in chronological order, but a lot of it was just like different things that I wanted to talk about that I felt like were misinterpreted or misrepresented. But now we are down to the Daniel P. Dukes incident. I just wanna say I have a very hard time believing that no one knew what was happening between Tillicum and Daniel. I just wanna point that out there. I do not believe that not a single soul knew what was happening in that tank between Tillicum and Daniel. I just don't. Like the film states, SeaWorld has cameras everywhere. They have security guards everywhere. And they have night trainers that still watch the whales to this day. And to say that 
a person was killed by Tilikum and apparently there were cameras and security guards and trainers everywhere and for none of those people or none of the cameras to pick it up or or to see it it just does not sit right with me like tell me that I'm wrong. Tell me that that is irrational. I don't know exactly what happened in that situation and why SeaWorld was super sketch about it, but something just didn't sit right with me with that. I, I don't know. I couldn't find anything, like no conspiracy theories or anything about it, but yeah, it just doesn't sit right with me. Next, the film talked about whether or not it was Don's fault and how SeaWorld put the blame on Don. It was not Don's fault. I don't even think it was Tilikum's fault. I fully blame SeaWorld. I fully put the blame on SeaWorld. SeaWorld knew Tilikum was aggressive and they still let the trainers near him. SeaWorld as a company was in charge of letting the trainers know this whale is aggressive. This whale is not to be near someone in the water. And they didn't do that. They allowed trainers to still be in the water with Tilikum. And because of that, I put full blame on SeaWorld. Now, people don't like that. Some people like to blame Tilikum. Other people such as SeaWorld like to blame Dawn. However, I have always thought if you are so quick to point fingers on and blame someone, maybe it's you. Maybe you're guilty too. But that's just my opinion. One of the last things I have written down is when Samantha Berg says young whales should be released and older whales that have put 25 years into this industry should be released into a Oceanside sea pen. I have to disagree with this. I believe every whale should be in a sea pen because there is no way that these killer whales can be released into the open ocean with just the ocean and just them with no human contact and no human intervention after being in captivity for years and years and years or even after being born into captivity. I think she had the right intention with saying that. I just think that young killer whales also should be in seaside sanctuaries and not just be released out into the ocean. Now that I kind of took everything that I thought was wrong with the film and put it out there for you guys. Let's talk about my final thoughts. I think Blackfish is a good movie to introduce someone into the problems of killer whale captivity. And I wholeheartedly dislike people that are like, well, did you watch Blackfish? This is why you shouldn't support SeaWorld because I watched Blackfish. And they have no other history or no other references or resources to back them up because Blackfish is a documentary. It's biased and it's made to make you feel emotions just like Seaspiracy was in my last My Honest Thoughts on video. And you cannot watch one documentary and claim you are an expert. I've had so many people tell me that just because I think SeaWorld should not shut down that I'm an idiot and I should watch Blackfish when in reality I've watched Blackfish probably more times than I can count on my hand. But they like to think that they know more than people who actually do research and educate themselves on this, which is why I do not like documentaries like Blackfish or like Seaspiracy, because people watch them and they think they're experts and they think they know more than the actual experts. Like I said, it's a good documentary to introduce you to Killer Whale Captivity, but it's not the holy grail documentary and the holy grail resource that you should rely on when you are making your case as to why you don't support SeaWorld. There are so many incredible books. I will go ahead and link them down below and I will put their names on the screen. But there are so many incredible books out there that dive deeper into killer whale captivity. And I think you will learn more reading any of these books than you would watching the hour and a half documentary that it's called Blackfish. My final rating for this film is a 5 out of 10. I would have given it a 6 out of 10, but just the fact that it's basic level information and it scratches the surface of killer whale captivity and doesn't dive into a lot more problems like Miami Seaquarium or Laura Parque. I know they touch on Laura Parque, but they really only touched on, I think his name is Alexis, Alexis, Alexis's death rather than talking about what else is wrong with Laura Parque. They only focused 
on the death of that trainer because it fit into their blackfish agenda. I gave it such a high rating because it did encourage a lot of people to do more research about killer whale captivity and it encouraged people to stop supporting SeaWorld and because of that, the Orca Welfare and Safety Act was passed in 2016 which prevented killer whales from coming in or out of California. It ended their breeding program and it ended theatrical shows. So shows like One Ocean and Believe were canceled, they were done with and now they have Orca Encounter which I have a very strong opinion on. Orca Counter is educational. They do have facts in there. However, it's still entertainment because the orcas are still performing to entertain us. Yes, it's not performing to music like Believe or One Ocean, but they're still entertaining us. While we're on the topic of shows, I just want to put out there, Believe was hands down the best SeaWorld show. Changed my mind. A lot of people ask me, okay, I watched Blackfish, I want to educate myself, what do I do next? Well first, you can read the books that will be linked in the description. I have read them and they provide so much education and so much insight into killer whale captivity. And next, you can get involved. You can check out programs like the Whale Sanctuary Project. I love this project. I went to a virtual conference back in January and the I believe the founder or the president or some title like that of the Whale Sanctuary Project spoke at the conference and they recorded it and I will put that down below. She explains everything going on with the Whale Sanctuary Project and I highly recommend Pro caps, anti caps, neutral caps, any stance on killer whale captivity people should watch that recording because oh, it's awesome. Do I think SeaWorld will ever surrender their orcas to be put in seaside sanctuaries? Probably not. I will say California probably does have a good chance because no killer whales can be moved out of California. However, Orlando and Texas, they're free to do with their orcas for whatever they want. They can sell them to overseas parks, they can sell them to God knows where they would sell them. They can put them in a seaside sanctuary. It is all up to SeaWorld's corporation with what happens with the San Antonio and Orlando whales. But as far as the California pod goes, they cannot be moved in or out of California, which if they do surrender them to a seaside sanctuary, I wonder how that will work because there's no seaside sanctuary in California. They're building it somewhere else. So I'm wondering if that act will compromise with moving them to a seaside sanctuary. With the sanctuary in mind, I also want to say, I do not think SeaWorld should shut down. What? Oh my gosh, Michaela, you're, you're an anti-cap and you don't think SeaWorld should be shut down? No, I don't think SeaWorld should be shut down and I'm gonna tell you why. Their rescue program rescues so many animals and let's be honest if they shut down they're not just kill there are not just killer whales there there's fish there's sea lions there's seals there's dolphins there's turtles there's so many animals that would be homeless and god forbid they get sent to facilities that are worse than SeaWorld i am pretty much convinced if SeaWorld shut down the animals that were at SeaWorld would end up at facilities and they would be worse off than they were at SeaWorld. Oh yes, the talk about freeing killer whales into seaside sanctuaries or even the ocean is good. It's a good start. We can't shut SeaWorld down. There will never be enough space for all of those animals to go to functional, adequate facilities. And I hate to say this, but SeaWorld is the worldwide best facility for marine park animals. They are worldwide leading in rescue, research, rehabilitation, veterinary care, and I'm sorry if other anti-caps don't like this, but the dolphins and the turtles and the fish and the sea lions at SeaWorld are at the best possible place. That was everything I thought was wrong with Blackfish, my final thoughts on Blackfish, and everything in between. I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you for watching. If you have other documentaries you guys want me to review, put them down in the comment section and also hit the subscribe button while you're down there because we are so close to 2,000 subscribers and I got a giveaway for you guys coming when we hit 2,000. And I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye.